As we continue on in our time of worship, we come to the reading of the Word, the Word of God. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I ask that if you would join me in reading the scripture, it's going to be on the screen behind me. It's also going to be in the, it's also in your worship folder. So if you would join me for this morning. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. And this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you bow with me for a brief moment? Gracious God, we thank you for your Word. Your word that continues to give us wisdom, your word that continues to give us strength, your word that continues to paint pictures in our heart and in our mind of who you're calling us to be. And Lord, this morning as we look at this letter from Paul, I ask that you give us your insight. I ask that you help our love to grow deeper and abound more and more. That we may grow in our knowledge of you that we may grow in our insight of who you're calling us to be, that we may be your children, and that we may be filled with the fruit of righteousness now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're starting a new series. We're, we're looking at this letter of Paul's, this 1 Corinthians, this first letter to the Corinth church that we have, uh, but we're going to jump in the middle, actually closer to the end. We're just going to look at chapter 12. Uh, and, and, and in this letter, Paul is, is sharing with us um, some interesting things. Uh, I, 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 but before we begin, I, I guess I want to ask this question. How do you learn? How do you learn something? Get a book? How'd you learn to drive? First time you hit the tree, you knew what you were doing? Josh, Jacob and Josh have a have a little power wheel Escalade, and, and Jacob's been driving it for, oh, I don't know, a couple years now. And uh, Josh started driving it this summer, and he hit an anthill, and Jacob said, you can't drive anymore because you don't know how to steer. As he ran in over this anthill, and it took me back to a time when Jacob was first learning, and he ran into trees. Uh, so it's like, yeah, okay, it all goes together. You, you kind of learn by doing. You kind of learn by reading, but you kind of learn. You learn by someone showing you. That you learn by someone speaking to you and letting you know what is happening and what is going on. As we come to this 1 Corinthians, this first letter that Paul has written, uh, this letter is kind of harsh. If you read the whole book of the whole letter of 1 Corinthians, you see that Paul is, is really letting this Corinth church know that they are not doing what they should be doing. They're suing each other. Uh, they're taking communion in the wrong way. The first people get there, eat everything up, so those who come later have nothing. Uh, they're, they're doing some sexually immoral things. And, and Paul's just not pleased with them. And, and so he's trying to set them right. He's trying to get them in a spot where they can respond to what God has done, where they can, they can see that Jesus is, is the Lord of their life. And so he comes, we come to this part of his letter, and he begins by saying, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed. That, that word ignorant or uninformed is, is you like this. In the Greek, it's, a, it's agnostic, which means not knowing, no knowledge, no understanding. And Paul's saying, you know what? I don't want you to be this way. I want you to know about the Spirit of God. I want you to know about the spiritual gifts that God has given. I, I don't want you to be uninformed about them. I don't want you to be using them or misusing them. I want you to know what they are and know what they, how they interact in your life and how they bring us together as a body of Christ. And so as, as we begin to unpack this, we're just looking at the first three verses today, and, and, and it's a, a very... Uh, interesting first beginning. Because as, as Paul was unpacking this, as he's saying, I don't want you to be uninformed, he jumps right into saying that, that, it, that those, you were once pagans, 
You once didn't know Jesus, and so you worshiped mute idols. I just want, therefore, I want you to know that, that uh, whoever says that Jesus is cursed is not from God. But whoever says Jesus is Lord is the Spirit working within them, speaking in them. And it's interesting that as Paul begins this, this section on spiritual gifts, he begins off by saying, Jesus is Lord. That's what you need to know about the spiritual gifts, first of all. You need to know that who Jesus is. You need to know what God has done. You need to know who, why Jesus came, why Jesus died, and why Jesus rose again. You need to have that at the center of your life. Because as that becomes at the center of your life, then there are other things that come forward. There's other things that, come, uh, that, that become clear. You begin to, to grow in your understanding. You begin to see that Jesus is a part of who you are and what you're doing. 1 Corinthians 12 is, is actually the beginning part of this letter that he goes through verse chapter 13 and chapter 14. And you're probably very familiar with chapter 13 where it says love is. And that has a whole bunch of things. But that love is, is, a, is I think, key to understanding the spiritual gifts. Because the spiritual gifts aren't done without love. They aren't given without love. They're not used without love. It all wraps up. It all comes together. Now, we'll go back to Jacob and Josh. I, I don't necessarily will trust Jacob and Josh to drive my truck. A little bigger, a little faster. I don't think they can reach, well, they can reach the pedals. They're tall enough. Um, but I'm not going to give them the keys. They're not ready. They're not prepared. As they continue to get older and as they continue to understand, they, they continue to, to gain insight and gain knowledge and gain understanding. And they continue to grow. And they continue to become, uh, hopefully become great young men. But it takes time. It takes understanding. It takes love. And as Paul is looking at this church in Corinth, he also knows that it's going to take time. It's going to take time for them to grow and understand. It's going to take time for them to see who God is and what God is doing. It's going to take time for them to understand that Jesus and Lord is Lord and what that means. For instance, um, go back to the time that you accepted Jesus as the Lord of your life. What was your understanding? You can talk now. <laughs> what was your understanding? Jesus took your sins away? Jesus forgave? What, what did that mean? They just polished your heart, took a rag, and just wiped it off. What does it mean today? As you, if you, as you have followed Christ, as you followed Jesus, if you, as you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, and you've grown in that relationship with Jesus, what does it mean now? What does that forgiveness mean? Not just, not just that surface forgiveness, but, but it goes deep into your hearts, right? It, it goes into that moment where you can say, you know what? Jesus has forgiven me. And, and all those things that I have done, not just the, the knowledge that he has done, but down into the depths of our heart. As Paul was saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know, I want you to understand, I want you to see what these gifts will do and, and why they're given. But it's got to come back to that first part in saying that Jesus is Lord. 
unpacking what that entirely means. We may glibly say he's not Lord of one thing, he's Lord of everything. But what does that mean? That he's just Lord of this 45 minutes? It's only 45 minutes now. Lord of this hour? Does it mean that he just has the service, the works that I do for him? What about those days when you're angry? What about those days when you're mad? What about those days where you're sad, depressed? Is Jesus still Lord? And what does that mean on those days? What does it mean? As I think about my life, and I think about when I accepted Christ, I, I was young, I was eight or so. I didn't quite understand. As I went into high school and lived in my high school days, I kind of understood. I didn't understand. As I got into college and was studying in engineering, I, I thought I knew. I had a sy systematic way. Makes me a good Methodist, right? I had a method. I didn't fully understand. 20 years after college, I have a good, a good knowledge. I've lived a life for God and understand what God is doing. But I still ask myself, what does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? Because that's a question that, that should drive us even more to understand what God is doing, to understand what he has gifted us with, as we go over the next three weeks or so, we, we're going to start unpacking what Paul is saying here. What it means. Not for Jesus to be Lord, but for Jesus to use us. For Jesus to use who we are and what we can do. To see what, what Jesus is calling us into and gifting us for. Because as Jesus is the Lord of our life, he will continue to give us opportunities and gifts to live him, to live out our life as he is Lord. And not just one hour, one day, two days. 40 hours, but 24-7. Jesus is Lord 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 365.25 days per year. So we get that leap year in there, which is next year, now that I've sidetracked myself. But it comes back to Jesus being Lord. This morning, we have this opportunity. We're going to partake in communion. We're going to have the bread, and we're going to have the juice, and we're the bread and the cup. Paul, earlier in his letter to the Corinth church, said that, that you need to come and take communion in a worthy manner. And there were some things that were going on in the Corinth church at that time, but as I, I think about that in today's, in our setting, in our word of today, I think it has us to come down and take communion knowing that Jesus is Lord. That as he died for our sins, his body was broken, his blood was shed, that we may be forgiven and we may be set free. That sin has no longer has mastery over us, meaning that sin no longer has hold on us 
that, that, that guilt and that shame has been taken away because the Lord of our life took on that penalty and removed that from us. Now, we still have those twinges, and we still have that, that, that shame and that guilt that pop up in our lives. But God has also given us a memory of who Jesus is and give us the experience that Jesus has cleansed us, that Jesus has set us free. John Wesley believed that communion is a, a means of grace. Communion is a way of seeing grace in action every day. And he would tell his clergy, he would tell the laity, he would tell all the people he could to take communion as often as you can. Because it helps us to remember, it helps us to be, and it helps us to see who we will be as we make Jesus the Lord of our life.